Amen. So keep your place there in Hosea chapter 7. We're going to get started, get about halfway through um, this chapter. So we're going through the book of Hosea. Hosea, a prophet against the northern kingdom of Israel, also throwing in some judgment against Judah here, but mainly preaching against um, King Jeroboam, the second Jeroboam, third son of Jehu. And we're looking at Hosea chapter number 7, and here we see more judgment, more comparisons of, you know, we see some uh, uh, similes, I guess you would call them, of, you know, comparisons of what Israel is like here in uh, Hosea chapter 7. Let's look down at verse number 1, where the Bible says, When I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was discovered, and the wickedness of Samaria. For they commit falsehood, and a thief cometh in, and the troop of robbers spoileth without. That just kind of pointing out there that as, you know, this judgment comes upon them, their prosperity is going to go away. You know, the Bible says that, you know, the nation that is prosperous is blessed by God. And then this is, you know, it just robbers are going to steal from them. The, the thief is going to come in and just take all their things away. This is why Matthew 6, 19 says that, you know, lay up not treasures on the earth, but lay up treasures in heaven where neither, you know, thief can break in and steal. Moth and rust doth corrupt the stuff on earth, but no one can steal your treasures in heaven, right? So as a nation goes into wickedness, their prosperity is going to go away. So this pattern is something that you'll see um, throughout the Bible and throughout history with nations that turn against God. Look at verse number two. And they consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their own doings have beset them about there before my face. Again, showing that, um, and we see this throughout the Bible as well, showing that nations um, that have committed wickedness and then get right, you know, they still have to pay for that wickedness that they did in the past. You know, he doesn't, God doesn't forget, you know, he doesn't just let things go. You know, that judgment has to come. Look at verse number three. They make the king glad with their wickedness and the princes with their lies. So here we see that the people are making the king happy with all the bad things that they're doing. So this is just a, a good example of, you know, a rotten leader produces rotten people. You see, the, the, the bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree produces good fruit. Another um, important um, lesson in the Bible. They are all adulterers. Even as an oven heated by the baker who seizeth from raising after he had kneaded the dough until it be eleven. So now he's talking about an oven that's just heated to the hottest, like it's ready to bake this bread. And we're going to have that pop up here in another couple verses. In the day of our king, the princes have made him sick with bottles of wine. He stretched out his hand with scorners. So here we got this wicked king. This wicked king has all these wicked people. And the wicked people and the princes underneath the king, they're all just, you know, celebrating and getting the, the king, you know, drunk with wine and he, turning him into one of the scoffers, one of the scorners as well. And we'll see how that works out for him. For they have made their, ready their heart like an oven. So again, we see the oven now applied to the heart of the people, like their heart is burning whilst they lie in wait, meaning they have, they're, they're getting this leader, this king, you know, um, drunk, and he's not understanding really what's happening. The people's hearts are bad, and they lie in wait. Lie in wait means they're, they're plotting against him, basically, is what that means. For their baker sleepeth all the night, meaning the fire's not tended. The heart is just burning, burning, burning. In the morning it burneth as a flaming fire. They are all hot as an oven, and have devoured their judges, and their kings are fallen. There is none among them that calleth unto me. So look at just, just think about the, the picture of what's happened here. I mean, he's talking about the judgment of a nation, the prosperity of the nation, is going away. Everyone steals from them. Everyone's taking away all their spoil, their things, their material goods. Then the king is happy with how wicked the people are, number one, is because, you know, why is a king happy with how wicked the people are? If you just look back at King Jeroboam, the first king of Israel, many times it's because the king himself is wicked and he's the one that led the people into wickedness in the first place. Thus the sins of Jeroboam being brought up over and over and over in the Bible, the king leads people into wickedness. Think of, the, think of the silliness of this circle here. He leads people into wickedness. When they become wicked, he's happy about that. Even as his nation is becoming less prosperous, they're not winning wars, they're getting spoiled by thieves and robbers, the people are wicked. But then those very people 
They come and they basically turn on him and they lie in wait, they plot against him, and they kill the very king that led him into wickedness in the first place. So it's just kind of this cycle of judgment and destruction. All right. And look at verse number eight. It says, Ephraim, he have mixed himself. And then oh, the, ver the last part of verse number seven. So it's kind of like showing you just this cycle of destruction that this leader and these people are going through. And then it says, even after all that, they don't even ask me for help. After all that destruction, after the train is just, the whole thing's just piled up and the cars are just burning, nobody reaches out to me for help. Verse number eight. Ephraim, again, you know, Israel, he hath mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. So what happens if you just light the oven on fire and just burn it and burn it and burn it and the, the baker goes to sleep? Well, it's just everything burns up. Everything's burnt. But look at verse number nine. That's what we're going to focus on this evening. Strangers have devoured his strength and knoweth it not, and he knoweth it not. So it's saying that all these things have happened all these people have come in, the, they've, they've mixed in with the people, they're robbing the people, the whole nation is a, is, a, is a flaming dumpster fire, and the people don't know what's going on. They don't ask God for help, he knoweth it not. But look at this, it says, Yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth it not. So what is the Bible saying there? The Bible is saying that Gray hairs are upon this person, this people, this nation. You know, it's saying gray hairs upon this nation, and they still don't know what's going on. All right now, this kind of uh, is an application of my um, all knowledge sermon. But let's look at this idea of gray hair for just a minute before I even tell you what the sermon title is. Turn to Proverbs chapter number 20. What is the Bible saying there? Yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth not. What does that mean? Look at Proverbs chapter number 20. Let's do a Bible study on gray hair, all right? I'm sure we're all getting gray hair, and uh, I'm getting gray hair for sure. And let's see what the Bible says about that, all right? Should we be depressed about that? Or, you know, is it, a, is it a neutral thing? Or what's the deal with gray hair? Proverbs 20, look at verse number 29. The Bible talks a lot about gray hair, actually. The glory of the young man is their strength, and the beauty of old men is the gray head. It's like, huh. So the Bible is saying, yeah, young men are strong, but old men have gray hair. I mean, it, like, it just you're like, okay, we might need to know some more detail on that. But I mean, if we just stop reading there, it's like, hey, don't dye your hair. Right? Keep the gray hair is what the Bible's saying. All right? Look at Proverbs 16. Go back a couple chapters and look at verse 31. So we've got to go like, dig a little bit deeper into the gray hair here. It says, so the young men, they have strength, but the old men have gray hair. All right? Why? What's so great about the gray hair? Look at Proverbs 16 and verse number 31. Proverbs 16, 31. The Bible says the hoary head, that means the, the, the gray or white hair of the head, is a crown of glory. But we have to read the whole thing. It says, if it be found in the way of righteousness. So that's a great verse there to apply right to Hosea 7 in verse number 9, right? Because it says, the hoary head is a crown of glory all the time, no matter what. If you have gray hair, you, you know, it's a crown of glory. It says, no. It says, if it be found in the way of righteousness. So we see that there's a, there's a, a gray head that can be a crown of glory, just as in Hosea chapter 7 in verse number 9, it's saying that, Yea, the gray hair was there upon him, yet he knoweth not. So gray hair is not like this automatic great thing, okay? But the Bible is saying it can be, it can be something that is very good. You say, why is that? Turn to Job chapter number 12. Turn to Job chapter number 12. So the Bible here is saying, I mean, obviously we can, we can kind of infer at this point that the gray hair, the, the hoary head, is talking about someone who's older in age, someone who's getting older, all right? It's saying that if it be found in the way of righteousness, that can be a crown of glory. Look at Job chapter number 12. Job chapter number 12. The Bible says this in Job 12 in verse number 12. It says, with the ancient is wisdom and in length of days understanding. So now we can see that the Bible is now just applying kind of what Proverbs 16 and Proverbs 20 was, you know, it's kind of explaining what Proverbs 20 and Proverbs 16 were implying, that with old age or length of days, 
is understanding. And understanding can be, you know, kind of paralleled with wisdom, right? Where you've taken all this knowledge and you understand things from that, you put that together and you can make wise decisions. With the ancient is wisdom and length of days is understanding. Turn to Job chapter 32. Job chapter number 32. And Job chapter 32 is just a really great um, reference to Hosea chapter number 7 and verse number 9 as well. It's a great um, reference to the same thing that Hosea 7, 9 is talking about. If you, just, if you ever write these little references in your Bible, this is one that I have written. Job 32 and verse number 7 says this. It says, I said, days should speak. Notice that word right there. Notice the word, days should speak. Meaning, meaning... Days should speak, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they will. This is kind of reminds me of Paul's language in the book of Romans, where he's like, I should do these things. You should do these things. And that's what people miss when they think, you know, like lordship salvation people or, you know, people that believe that like once you once you get saved, uh, the Holy Ghost is just going to like turn you into a robot and just kind of direct your actions. Right. Like, yeah, but you will have the works, though. Like, no, no, you're not saved by works, but if you get saved, you will have the works because, like, you just lose free will or something like that. No, Paul says should. Just like in Job chapter number 32 here, we have to pay attention to this word that says, days should speak. Days should speak, and multitude of years should teach wisdom. But, now look at this, but there is spirit in man. And the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Now, verse number 9 kind of sums it up, doesn't it? It says, great men, now this is like Hosea 7, 9 right here. Great men are not always wise. Neither do the aged understand judgment. Did you know that? Did you know that great men are not always wise? I mean, a lot of people misunderstand that. And like, a lot of great men, it's talking about great men like powerful, like you know, uh, rich, or they have a lot of power, or they're rulers, or whatever. But it says, great men are not always wise. Just think about today. Just think about today. And, and notice it says, great men are not always wise. Okay, but just, just t look at this from a secular perspective. Okay, look at somebody who's just like a billionaire. All right? I mean, most of the time, I would say, like, a billionaire is not someone who's, who's a, a, an idiot, who's not like, doesn't have some level of intellect that's at least, you know, above the midwit range, I would say. But it's possible that there are many, many, I mean, the Bible here is saying that they're not always wise. Like there's many, many rich people and many, many powerful people that, you know, maybe they inherited that money. There's many, many like very wealthy and powerful people that they got in that position just because they got lucky. You know, they just, they just were in the right place at the right time. I remember I came out of college and into the, into the workforce in 1999. And what was happening? You guys, are, a lot of you are too young to, understand, uh, to remember this, not understand, but to remember. That was the dot-com boom. Like in the 1995 to 1999, it ended right around 2000, 2001. But there was just, there was many engineers that I came out of college and went to work with and they were engineers just like me. They were either, they were maybe slightly above my level. Many of them were just three or four years older than me. And they lived in just million dollar mansions just because they just worked for some company that IPO'd and they just were in the right place at the right time and they just became millionaires overnight. And I worked with a bunch of people like that. And then of course that all ended in you know, 2000, 2001 and you know, the kind of the party was over um, there. But I mean, look, not all great men are always wise. You know, I'm not saying these men weren't wise, but they were not any more wise than anybody else. They were just in the right place at the right time. People inherit money. People, you know, have the right last name, whatever it is, and they get into positions of power, whatever it is. And not every single great man that you see is wise. And that's kind of the point of the sermon tonight. It says, neither do the aged understand. And that's really what we're going to look at tonight. Neither do the aged understand judgment. Look, the lesson here is this. Age, age should make you better. It should make you better. Time should make you better. 
That's what I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about using your time wisely in your life. All right, I want to give you a couple challenges this evening. So I want to go through some points and I want to give you some challenges to kind of take forward after tonight. So if you write down notes, these are good ones to write down. But turn to 2 Samuel chapter number 14. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter number 14. The title of the sermon is Using Your Time Wisely. Using Your Time Wisely wisely. You'll see a lot of young people today and we'll go and we'll talk to teenagers about dying and going to heaven and they don't take that question as seriously as maybe somebody who's not a teenager or whatever because you know young people they don't seem to care as much about time as somebody who's a little bit older. All right look at 2 Samuel chapter number 14. 2 Samuel chapter number 14. To young people one of the one of the biggest downsides of being a young person is that to them, time seems infinite. But the Bible teaches against that. Look at 2 Samuel 14 and verse number 14. The Bible says, for we must needs die. This is why we go out soul winning, because everyone is going to die. For we must needs die and are as water spilt on the ground, which, look at this, cannot be gathered up again. Neither does God respect any person. This is why, you know, I always talk about how Einstein was wrong. We're never going to be able to travel back in time. I mean, the Bible says that it can't be gathered up. You can't put it back in the cup. You can't put it back. And I believe that time, and I want to show you tonight, God uses time to motivate us. God uses time to motivate us. So the first point is that time can't be replaced. That's not the challenge. But the first point is time cannot be replaced. It is one of the main things that you will find in your life that you cannot replace. You cannot put it back. It cannot be gathered up. Again, the Bible says, look, if you've wasted time in your life, if you come to me or somebody and you're asking counsel and you say, well, I've wasted 10 years of my life, that is a problem that cannot be solved. There is no answer to that wasted 10 years. That's why Jesus says the only answer is put your hand to the plow and look forward. Jesus tells you not to look back because it can't be fixed. You can't get it back. So that's the first point that we need to realize. Look, we don't want to be somebody that has gray hair and no knowledge. But that person that has gray hair and no knowledge, they've wasted time. They've wasted that person that has gray hair and no knowledge. They've wasted all of their time. If you want to take that to the extreme example. But look, so many things are not just evil. We talk about so many influences in the world, and whether it be media, you know, whatever these things are. So many things are not just evil, bad influences that change you, like I talked about on Sunday. Or, you know, they, they, they change you. They influence you to think a certain way. They change your heart. Uh, they want you to. They want to get you into the flesh versus the spirit. All these things. So many. I mean, so many things are just wastes of time. I mean, in addition to that, but one of the biggest evils about a lot of those things is they're getting you to waste your life. Really, I mean, if you just think about you know what people are doing today, and I want you to think about this. This is going to be one of the challenges. I want you to think about a typical day. I want you to think about a typical day. I'm going to ask you to change something tonight. I'm going to ask you to change something in your life. I mean, extreme, right? But think about the average person is awake about 15 to 16 hours a day, assuming you sleep for eight hours a day. Maybe you don't sleep for eight hours a day. Maybe you're awake longer than that. But the point is, is that most of people's waking hours, you know, teens and adults anyway, are spent staring at a screen. I've talked about this before. Seven to nine hours of that 16 hours are staring at a screen. That's a TV screen, that's a computer screen, that's a YouTube screen, whatever. It's video game screen. We talked about the other, the other night, like sports and all this kind of stuff. Like talk about a complete waste of time. Sitting in front of a, you know, a, a TV watching a four hour you know, football game that you're not, you know, it, it's, it's a complete waste of your life. People eat for about an hour a day. They drive for about an hour a day. And then the rest of the time, people are working or doing something that they would probably claim is productive. But the point is, between screen time, sports, stupid, meaningless things, I mean, how many stupid, meaningless things are people watching on the internet today? Right? How many of those things? So here's challenge number one. Here's challenge number one. 
map out a typical day for yourself, map out a typical day for yourself, and remove the most egregious time-wasting thing that you find out of that typical day. And live like that for a while. I know we had the, 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 the phone challenge and what was it? It was in June. You know, look at the most egregious time-wasting thing every single day. I'll often say to people in a nice way at the door, you know, when I'm trying to get them to watch the video, I'll say, look, everybody wastes 15 minutes a day on their phone, right? And just waste some time watching this. You know, and people will admit, yeah, yeah, they, they waste time. Of course, they waste way more than 15 minutes every single day. But look, find the most egregious time-wasting thing, the thing that is just not edifying to you. Here's something that I do, and it's just not edifying. It's not taking me anywhere. It's not doing anything for me. It's probably hurting me in different areas. Find that one thing, the worst thing. I'm not saying you clean it all up tomorrow, buddy, but I'm saying find the worst thing and just take it out of your life and see if you can keep that going for a while. And now step number two is the second point. So that's the first point. Find the most egregious time-wasting thing that you do. You're like, I don't waste any time. Perfect, all right? Perfect. Stop being delusional. Maybe that's your thing to take out of your, your life. Turn to Second Chronicles chapter number two. Let's talk about utilizing your time. So the first thing is stop wasting your time. Now let's talk about utilizing your time, all right? The problem is what? What's the problem statement? The problem is we got gray hair and we got no wisdom. All right, that's what we're trying to stop here. So look at Second Chronicles chapter number two. Look, you gotta learn to do things that utilize your time in a valuable way. Look, what I've found is you simply cannot replace. As far as skills and getting wisdom and things like this, you simply cannot replace experience. You can, there is no replacement for simple time on the job or time doing a certain task. Look, there's no amount of reading there's no amount of studying that can replace. Look, I'm not saying reading and studying are a waste of time. But I'm saying that, look, when it comes to actually learning how to physically do something and that is valuable, that is edifying to you, not, not necessarily like just spiritually, but in your life, I'm saying that there is no amount, there's nothing that can replace time doing it. There's nothing that can replace. I can read about a, a, a process. I can read about you know, um, putting something together, but nothing will teach me how to do it better than actually doing it again and again and again. Doing it uh, and just practicing that skill over and over and over. Time on the job. Look, nothing can replace it. Nothing can replace being in the field. I've said that about engineering for like literally decades now, making, I'm aging myself, but there is, there is no, engineer that will be a great engineer if he's never been out in the field. Because you can learn things in the book, you can learn things, how, how the math works and all these things, but they just simply work differently in the world. And they sim it, you just learn so much when it, when it comes to working with other people, and I don't want to give away a lot of this, but look, nothing can replace experience. That's the point. And experience takes what? Experience takes time. Experience takes time. This is why I am positive. I am positive. I'm convinced in my own mind that the pre, that pre-flood civilizations were not stone people like beating with stone hammers. You say, what, what are you talking about? Because like in my life, I have seen that the more time someone has in a skill, in a trade, in a profession, whatever it is, the, the, generally the better they are at it. I mean, you look at people in the Bible, you look at Adam, who was 930 years old when he died. I mean, I'm pretty sure that, you know, Jared, Jared was 962. Methuselah was 969. Lamech, he died young at 777. But these men lived for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. We may have a career as a man that's, what, 40 years long? These men lived for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Think of the things that they must have perfected. Think of the things that they must have been able to do. United States average age, life expectancy. Who knows it? What is it? One of the guys, what do you, what's your guess? 76. 
82. 79. No, it's 76 years old. All the technology, all the AI, all the knowledge, all the billions and trillions of dollars going into pharmaceuticals and all these things, all the medicine, all the research, all the dietary knowledge on YouTube, 76 years, that's what we can do. 76 years, you know what that tells me? We don't have a lot of time to waste. The, I mean, 76 years, and the Bible is literally telling us that nothing can stop this. We don't have a lot of time. Billions of dollars won't save you. I mean, a healthy life might buy you a few. Maybe, who knows? Tough to prove. But it can't be put back in the bottle. It's water on the ground. And with us, we don't have a big jug like Adam head or Methuselah head. We got a little, we got, we got this. And look, so this is challenge number two right here. All right. And if you've already got challenge number two knocked down in your life, then I'm going to give, uh, then I'm going to give you a challenge 2A. All right. So challenge number two is this. We're talking about utilizing your time. We're talking about utilizing your time. Here's challenge number two. What did we see? We see we waste time on worthless things. Challenge number two is this. Find something worth doing and start doing it yesterday. That's challenge number two. You say, what part of my life? I don't know. As many as you can find. In your spiritual life, of course. Find something worth doing and start doing it yesterday. I've said this many times. It takes 10,000 hours to become an expert at something. 10,000 hours. At a 40 hour a week job, that's like four to five years. That's a long time. Are you in 2 Chronicles chapter number two? 2 Chronicles chapter number two. I'm going to tell you a tale of two fathers. I'm going to tell you a tale of two fathers tonight. I love this story in 2 Chronicles chapter number two. Solomon's getting ready to build the temple, and David was friends with the king of Tyre. David was friends with the king of Tyre. So his son is looking to the king of Tyre's son for help. Okay, so we've got sons and we've got fathers involved here. Of course, David was the father that was, David's not one of the fathers I'm talking about, but David was the one that was not allowed, the first, you know, he was not allowed to um, build the temple because he spilled too much blood. God told him his son's going to do it. So Solomon's getting ready to build the temple. And Hiram, now this is the, the king of Tyre's uh, son here. It says, Hiram said, Moreover, blessed be the God, Lord God, verse number 12, of Israel, that made heaven and earth, who hath given David given to David the king a wise son, endued with the prudence and understanding that might build an house for the Lord and an house for his kingdom. And now I have sent a cunning man, endued with understanding of Hiram, my father's. So he's saying, I'm sending you this guy, right, that my father knew. All right, and look at verse number 14. It says, the son of a woman of the daughters of Dan and his father, so we've got We've got the king, we've got the original king's son, who's the king in verse 13, and he's sending this cunning man that his father knew. So we've got that father, and then we've got this father of this cunning man, and his father, this is the cunning man's father, was a man of Tyre, skillful to work in gold and in silver and in brass, in iron and stone, in timber, in purple and blue, in fine linen and in crimson. Also to grave any manner of graving and to find out, I mean, look, he's, he's, he's a craftsman. Of, of all these different metals and materials and woods and fabrics. He's an expert at crafting all these materials. But then it gets even better. It says, to find out every device which shall be put to him, thy cunning man and with the cunning men of my Lord David, thy father. He's saying that he can, he can figure out how to work any tool. He can build any tool. He can fix any machine. He can make machines. He's like, this is the guy right here. So number one father is the father of the cunning man. I don't want to talk about. Look at, look at this quote here. It says his father was a man of Tyre, skillful to work. It doesn't tell you what the cunning man could do. Notice that. It tells you what his father could do. It said his father was skillful to work in gold and silver and brass and iron, in stone, in timber. Look, you know how, you know how skillful you have to be to work in metal? You know how skillful you have to be to someone that can just take and just create things? I, I'll, I'll tell you about a guy that I knew like this in just a few minutes. But 
it takes talent that, that to, to, to perfect it takes decades. And like no one knows this today because no one knows how to do this today. But if you've met one of these people, it's, it's nothing short of amazing. All right? In purple and blue, fine linen, every crimson, also to give any manner of graving. He could, meaning he could grave in stone, grave in gold, grave in all these things. And to find out, I mean, that means that the guy was like an artist too, which is such a weird combination. Because, I mean, I, am, I, I consider myself pretty technically savvy with machines and things like that. But, like, you tell me to draw a picture and I'm done. Like, it's, it's like a stick man, right? It's, it's horrible, right? And to find out every device. Now, just think about this. It's talking about his father. The cunning man's father could do all of these things that we just talked about for the last few minutes. But look, how much time must that have taken to teach this son? How much time must this father have spent teaching this cunning man these things? We're going to talk about working with your kids a little bit later. Let's go back to experience. All right, let's go back to experience. And I just want you to think about that for a second. How much time that must have taken for this father to transfer all of that skill and knowledge and wisdom to this son? Because it's the son that is being sent to Solomon not the father. The second father. Go back to verse number 13. Look, there's outliers here and there, folks. But let me tell you something. In general, simply nothing can beat the experienced person. In general. There might be somebody who can learn and become an expert in four years versus somebody that takes six years. But the point is, it takes time to become an experienced person. Expert. Look at the second father in verse number 13. It says, Now I have sent a cunning man endued with understanding of Hiram, my father's. Now this is the king talking to Solomon. And he's saying, There's this guy that my dad, the king, knew. And we're going to use this guy. And I'm sure that this king's father worked with the father of the cunning man. So this is a generational thing that we're seeing come down here. But notice the king's son. Look, his dad taught him a super important lesson. The king's son is also very skillful here. Because the king's son, his dad, and let me tell you something. This is a super valuable lesson. Because look, it takes decades and decades of experience to become this cunning man. We know that. But let me tell you what really, really smart people will do. Really, really smart people, people that are next level smart people, they will utilize the experience and wisdom of others. And let me tell you something, that's what this kid knows. That's what this next king, this next generation king knows. He knows what his father taught him. He knows to utilize the son of the man who spent that time to teach his son these skills. And let me tell you something, he knows that it's a force multiplier. It's a force multiplier as far as what you can accomplish in your life. I learned this lesson in my late 20s. I learned this lesson in my late 20s because it may surprise some of you young men, but I also thought that I knew everything when I was young. I also thought that I had it all figured out when I was young, even in the workforce. When I was a young manager of, of projects, I had no shortage of ideas. I knew how I wanted it done, and I knew how we were going to do it, and I was, you know, 28, 29 years old, hard charging. But look, I learned this lesson, and I learned this lesson because some wise men in my life gave me some wisdom. They gave me this wisdom, this wisdom that you had better utilize the experience of those who have come before you, if you want to be really successful. I, it was interesting. I, had, I, I, I can't remember um, who it was, actually, but there was a, a wise man once told me when I was working on a, a project, and I was kind of had this, this go after everything, and I, I got it all figured out attitude, and I got guys on my team that are twice my age. And he said, be careful, or these guys will let you make your own decisions. <laughs> and that was a very wise thing to say. What, and what he was saying in not such a subtle way, he was saying, utilize the experience that is in front of you. 
Utilize the experience that's already there. Because look, we got 76 years. It is simply not possible for you to gain all the experience that everyone in that room has. It's not possible. I got a guy that's been, uh, that's been you know, an expert on valves for 30 years. Valves. You're like, isn't a valve just on and off? No. An expert on every type of valve, how it controls, how it flows under every pressure, what kind of packing is in it, what kind of, you know, what type of valve it is, what's the best type of valve to use in every single control or process scenario. Like, there is no way if I studied valves for two years that I could gain a quarter of the knowledge that that guy has. And he's saying, utilize that experience. There's a guy that I knew that could make anything, anything I could think of, he could make out of metal. Anything I could think of, he could tell me what kind of metal we needed to make it out of, and he could create it. I, I would come to, to work like in, in a couple days, and after we had talked about this and drawn these things out, and i come and look, and I would just be like, what in the world? There's no way if I studied and, and practiced and went into that trade for 10 years that I could have done that. Yet here it was, right in front of me. This is the king's son. This is the valuable lesson that the king son knew. I mean, there was a guy that I worked with that could remember everything that happened in the plant for 30 years. It was crazy. He just remembered everything. He remembered everything and, you know, then somebody would throw out an idea or I would throw out an idea and he's like, yeah, we tried that combination of things back in 1984 and here's what happened. And you're like, whoa, but the math said it should work. Yeah, I know, but, it, you know, that's what happened. The place almost exploded. So, I mean, just things like that, you can't recreate yourself. And that's what this king's son knew. This king's son knew to utilize that force multiplier of other people's experience because we only have so much time. So to utilize time, we can utilize the experience of others. Apply that to a spiritual life. God gave you pastors and teachers. God gave you counsel in your life. You don't have to fall in every hole yourself. There's other, I mean, there's, there's three ways to learn. You can fall in the hole yourself. You can watch somebody else fall in the hole. Or you can listen to counsel and just not, you know, just avoid the hole altogether. All right? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. So the first challenge was this. The second challenge was this. Find something worth doing and start doing it yesterday. If you're like, I already know, like, I already know in my, in my I already know I have a career path. I already know what I want to do. I'm already on that. You know, give me something else then utilize, get better at utilizing the experience and wisdom of others. Think about the people around you. Think about the people that have more wisdom than you. Think about the, you're like, nobody has more wisdom than you. Well, then you're, you're done, if that's what you think. You're, you're, you're over, if that's, if that's you, all right? But look, challenge two is find something worth doing it and start doing it yesterday. And if you're already doing that, then Start getting better at utilizing the experience of others. I'm telling you, it is a force multiplier. In your spiritual life, you can make mistakes that can cost you years. You can make mistakes in your spiritual life that can set you back 10 years. You, I mean, you hear about it all the time. Somebody falls into some stupid thing, and they get out of church, and they, many people just never come back, but they just waste 10 years of their life. A lot of people that, you know, drink and do drugs, they'll talk about it. You just wasted 20 years of my life. And they just wake up, you know, and hopefully they wake up out of it. But utilize the experience and the wisdom of other people. And look, even people that have gone down the wrong path, you can utilize their mistakes. You can utilize their counsel in those areas. You can utilize like, hey, don't be like me. You know, this is what happened to me. You can utilize, you know, the bad stories, the mistakes of others. I'm not saying go ask people that, you know, have wrecked their life advice. I'm saying look at the mistakes other people have made and notice the hole that they fell in and step around it. That's what I'm saying. Utilize the experience and wisdom of others. All right? So look, first point, first point was we waste too much time. The second point is, and the second challenge was to utilize your time. The third point is this. 
We need to think about this. We need to think about this. I want to bring it back to the first father, but we need to think about time with family. We need to think about time with our families. And this kind of brings up that point of that first father. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. And I bet you never heard this verse applied this way before. But I was thinking about this this year. I was thinking about this year with my anniversary. I thought about this verse. Look at verse number 15. It says, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So this is a verse talking about the Christian when he gets to heaven, that you know, they're, they're going to be shown what they did in their life. All right, I'm just going to paraphrase this, this, uh, this theology for you here. When you get to heaven, you're going to be shown everything that you did in your life. And you are going to know, look, you're not going to lose your salvation. You're going to be in heaven. Say, I got saved, and I did nothing. Say, I got saved at the door, and that's it. I continued doing everything that I was doing, and I didn't give God five minutes of my time. When you get to heaven, you're going to know that you wasted your whole life. When you get to heaven, like I said, you're not just going to be the gray-haired guy that had no wisdom. You're going to know. You're going to look back, and you're, look, you're, you're going to be in heaven, but you're going to know. You're going to, you're going to suffer loss. You're going to be like, oh, I could have spent that 50 years. I could have spent that 50 years doing something worthwhile for the Lord. And I was thinking about that as my anniversary came up this year. And I was thinking about that, and I, I told my wife this. And you know what? Let me just... Let me just rabbit trail here for a couple minutes because I think that a lot of people miss this. You see, the Bible talks about, and I preach about, divorce. God hates divorce. God hateth putting away. God teaches in Ephesians chapter 5 about, in other, many other places, that men are to love their wives. Wives are to reverence their husband. We get all that. We understand that. We got the mechanics of it. We got the mechanics of these things down. And look, I think that there's many Christian people out there that the wife would never get divorced and the husband would never get divorced. And I've, had, I've, I've known many people like that. But what I think a lot of people miss, and I think should probably be preached on more, is the relationship. Is the relationship. Because in our lives, if I never get divorced from my wife, and my wife never wants to get divorced from me, Praise God, my children are all under my authority. The Bible says so. But I'm not guaranteed the relationship. There's no guarantee for that. And look, here's the irony. Here's the irony. Just like knowledge, the more time you spend with somebody, just like knowledge and the economic lesson I gave you on knowledge, that the more knowledge there is, the less we value it. The irony is this. The more time we spend with people, the less we seem to value that time. And this is what I told my wife uh, after our anniversary this year. I don't know if I was just thinking about it. And I said, you know what? I, I said, we can't get used to each other. Because I wake up every morning and she's there. And I come home every day and she's there. And she's always there. And she's always waiting for me and she's always saying goodbye to me. And I don't ever want to get used to her. And I told her, I don't want you ever to get used to me. Because I'm always there. She can always rely on me. I mean, hopefully, not perfect. But you see, a husband and a wife can get used to each other. And I don't want to get to heaven, and this is why I was thinking about this verse, I don't want to get to heaven and realize that there was 10 years where I got used to my wife. And I, I didn't appreciate her like I should have. And she, maybe she got used to me. And we didn't do what? We didn't appreciate that relationship. We didn't build that relationship like we could have. We don't have 76 years. We don't have, you get married when you're 20. You get married when you're 22. What, what do you got, 50 years? We don't have that much time. I don't want to get to heaven and realize I wasted half of it. I want to spend every single day, I want to utilize the time. 
I want to spend, you know, look, you can spend time together, but realize that I, I don't want to realize that I wasted 10 years. I don't want to realize that I wasted one year. I don't want to realize that I wasted one week. Because I believe that I'll suffer that loss. I believe that I will look back and I'll be like, oh man, I could have, we could have had a better relationship for that year or that week or that 10 years or whatever it is. So for this reason, I believe that if you waste time elsewhere, doing things without your family, doing things without your children, I, I believe that you will know what they could have been is what I'm trying to get at here. And I believe you will suffer that loss. I believe you will know that one day. So for this reason, what we need to make time. We need to appreciate time. And look, in my opinion, this is my opinion, but you should take it. In my opinion, a, a married man should rarely do things that don't include his family. Rarely. You can't, nor should you work all the time. A married man should not have hobbies that don't include his family. That's, that's not in the Bible. I'm just telling you. A married man should not be out spending four hours on the golf course with his buddies once a week without anyone in his family. Hey, you want to go out golfing with your kids or something? That's a different thing. You should incorporate. I'm not saying don't ever have hobbies, but you should incorporate hobbies that have your children with you, from somebody in your family, and then rotate those things through. This, I mean, fishing with your kids, hunting with your kids, all these different things, you should just not be running off by yourself That's right. as a married man. I was just talking about this the other night with, with some guys from the church. I mean, you, you, should be, you should be, when you have things to do, even when you're at home, you should be working on projects with your kids. I am sure the cunning man's father could have gotten his graving, his devices, his metalworking done a lot faster if he did not have his son with him. Because when they're small, from like the age of, you know, two to nine, if I got to ballpark it, they're really not helping. They're learning. But that's a lot of time it's slower and look if you're sitting here saying like you know you're crazy then okay let me know how that works out you'll suffer the loss I'm telling you a married man should set boundaries so he can accomplish these goals to where this time is spent with his family and look it takes a lot of time as we see the cunning man's father must have taken a ton of time I mean, it's just less efficient. You've got to explain everything to them. You've got to explain what we're doing, and they do it wrong. It takes patience. Look, I'm somebody that likes to get things done. I'm, I'm somebody that sees, I start things, and I see the end of the thing. And I just want to put my head down, and I've got to get it done. But they do it wrong. They're not helping. They're, they're many times messing things up. But how are they going to learn anything? How is your daughter going to learn how to do all these things that daughters used to know how to do? How are these sons going to know how to do all these things that sons used to know how to do if you don't spend the time? I mean, if you don't want to spend the time, what in the world? Why'd you get married? Why'd you have kids? Time's not the only variable to build and maintain this relationship, but it's a big one, let me tell you. It's not the only one, but it's a big one. It's a big one. So we need to utilize our time with our families. Turn to James chapter number four. We need to utilize the time with our wives. It is really easy to get caught up in life. And let me tell you something. It is really easy for a man, a man of action, a busy man, a man that's out there getting it done. I think maybe the risk is more for you that you take your wife for granted. That you just 
assume that all this trouble that you're fighting, all the dragons that you're slaying out here, all the things that you're doing, all the things, all the problems that you have, the, the living that you have to provide, all the, the, the garbage you're dealing with out in the world, it is really easy to take for granted that she's always there and she's always going to be there. Well, you should tell your wife, you should go home and tell your wife tonight, maybe this is challenge number three, go home and tell your wife tonight that let's not ever get used to each other. There's a challenge for your marriage. You don't get used to me, and I won't get used to you. And as the things that are busy in my life, I will stop those things. I will clear those things from my mind. I will make time for you to appreciate you, husband, to appreciate you, wife, every single day. Because if you're doing this Christian life right, you're both busy. You're both busy spending time with the kids. And as the kids come and more kids come, it gets harder and harder to appreciate your wife and appreciate your husband. But look, let me just tell you something. Don't ever get used to each other. That's challenge number three. And if you're not married, when you get married, you, take, you, you keep that one. Don't get used to each other because it's easy to do because she's always there. Thank God she's always there. Thank God he's always there. But don't get used to it. I don't want to get used to my wife. I hope she never gets used to me. James chapter number 4. James chapter number 4. I've got to wrap it up here. Look at verse number 14. Time is a warning, folks. That's what we see in Hosea chapter 7 and verse number 9 and everywhere else throughout the Bible. Time is a warning to us. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, you, you don't even know how much of it you have. I'm sitting here 76 years, you got 50 years, you got 50 years. You don't know if you got five minutes. I mean, time is such a use. I mean, you think about from God's perspective, time is such a useful tool for us. And he's just warning us again and again and again. He's like, don't let the days go by and not learn anything. Don't let the days go by and not spend time with your kids. Don't let the days go by and take your wife for granted and take your husband for granted. Use that time. Serve the Lord. It takes time to come to church when you've got a bunch of kids and you've got to get everybody ready. It takes time. It takes much more time than before you had kids. It takes time. For what is your life? It is even as a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. And there's no fairness to it. There's no fairness to it. Some people die young. Some people live old age. Some people that live terrible lives live to be 100. And some people that serve the Lord live to be 25. They're, they're, it's just, but God's telling us it's a vapor. You don't know how much you have. Use it. Use it serving the Lord. Use it serving our families. Using it building the relationships that God has blessed us with. Think about your time. Think about your days. I, I was at uh, SeaWorld a couple weeks ago, and I couldn't get my wife to go on a roller coaster. And I tried to use this against her, and I said, what if this was my last day on earth? Would you then go on the roller coaster with me? Because she told me, she's like, because I, I spent most of the day like convincing and like lobbying the two kids to go on the roller coasters, and I did pretty well. You know, guilting them, all kinds of different tactics I was using. You know, different tactics for the girls as I would use with, you know, you, know, you use different tactics. I was pretty good at it, and I was pretty successful. And my wife, I turned to my wife, and she's like, don't even waste your time. Like, I'm not going on one of those roller coasters. I was like, what if this was my last day on there? She's like, but it's not. <laughs> and it wasn't. But the point is this. Just like knowledge, the more time that we think that we have, we don't know how much time we have. So we can't do this thing that we do with knowledge and this thing that we do with things that we think we have a big supply of. We can't value it at zero because we really just never know, no matter how old you are in this room tonight, we've got a wide range of, of ages here tonight. And none of you know who has more time than anybody else in this room. And that's what makes it such a great tool for God to use to motivate us to not waste it and to utilize it in our lives. We should value it more. We should value it more. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.